thank you so much for coming to this May meeting of the Library Marketing Book Club. Good to see everybody. Um, this month, we're talking about the One Page Marketing Plan by Alan Dibb. Uh, we've got uh, about 12 people on the line right now. Oh, here comes some more. Um, so we've got, uh, we've got a small enough group on the line to, so far today that I think we can afford the time to just go through real quick um, introductions to get to know everybody. So just really quick, I'll call on, uh, on you by what I see in your Zoom window. And if you can just say your name and library system you're from and what you do there real quick, um, give us an idea to get to know each other. So uh, Rachel Karras. Uh, I am the Library Events and External Relations Assistant at the Leatherby Libraries, which is at Chapman University in Orange County, California. All right, thanks, Rachel. Um, J.D. Smithson. Hi there, um, I'm J.D. I am the Communications Coordinator um, for the Coeur d'Alene Public Library in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Okay, thanks. Uh, Donna Forbes. Hello, I'm Donna Forbes. I am the Marketing and Events Coordinator for Illinois Prairie District Public Library in Woodford County, Illinois, which is kind of like right by Peoria. Okay, uh, thanks. Uh, Kay Lewis. Oh, Kay, your audio may not be working. Your camera looks like it's not working, so, um, oh. I see somebody else chatting away. So yeah, if your camera audio is not working, go ahead and chat. Uh, Tammy Gross, uh, just real quick, your name, library, and what you do there. Um, hi, I'm Tammy uh, from Goffstown, New Hampshire, uh, Goffstown Public Library, and I work on social media and the library website. Cool. Uh, April Schultz. Hi, my name is April Schultz. I'm the marketing coordinator for the Madison County Public Library System in Madison County, Kentucky. Cool. Uh, Megan McCorkle. Hey, I'm Megan McCorkle with the Enoch Pratt Free Library in Baltimore, Maryland. I'm the marketing and communications director. Thanks, Megan. Uh, Riley Kern. Oh, Riley, you're out of camera or microphone. Uh, Outreach Librarian at Washington Talking Book and Braille Library. Um, Cam Rose also has no mic, uh, so it's Shannon at Cam Rose in Cam Rose, Alberta, Canada. Um, Genevieve. Or jean -Vieve. Maybe another non-working mic. Uh, Joanne Quinn. Hi, um, I'm Joanne Quinn, Director of Communication and Marketing at um, Falvey Library at Villanova University outside of Philadelphia. Cool, thanks, Joanne. Mm -hmm. And I have one more, it's GPPL2 host two. Yeah, maybe not. Oh, maybe I got another message. Ah. Mary Short from Gross Point Library in Michigan, Marketing and Program Coordinator. Thanks, Mary. All right, so thanks everybody for joining us. Um, we'll see if, again, people may just be rolling in, but uh, let's talk about the book that we read this month. And if you had a chance to read it, great. Um, and so the book was The One Page Marketing Plan by Alan Dibb. Uh, so just, to start out, who's got something to say about uh, we can follow this path that I thought was kind of interesting of what you liked, what you, um, what, <laughs> what it lacked, what you longed for, and then there's another L that I can't think of at the moment, but, um, uh, but I'll find what you it learned. Second. What you learned. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So, so let's start with uh, with either like or whatever you want to say. Who's got something that uh, that they want to share about what they liked about it? Amanda. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Never mind. Um, and uh, yeah, anybody jump in. Who's got something they liked about this book? Oh, 
I'll jump in. Um, Thanks, Rachel. For me, I had a lot of mixed feelings about this one, um, <laughs> but the the strongest part for me, which is something that we've looked at in one of the other books we've read, and I can't remember which one now, um, but the, the, the focus of the marketing is on what the results of what you have to offer. Are. So you're not marketing what you have to offer, you're marketing the results of what you have to, to offer for your patrons. Um, and I think that that's something that I lose sight of a lot of. It's just, hey, let's market. We've got these resources and we've got these collections and these events without remembering the part of, we've got these things that can, because we're a university library, help you ace your finals, or we've got the, re the collections that can help you avoid high textbook prices or yeah. things like that. So I think that focus on the results of what you offer being the thing to market was really helpful for me. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I thought that was pretty good. Yeah, it is something to keep focused on and it's hard, especially with all the different things that um, libraries offer. So yeah, that was a good one. Um, anybody have any thoughts about that or um, something else they liked about the book? I just, I just got the book yesterday, so <laughs> okay. it's, it's yellow, it's very bright. <laughs> like that, yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It's cool if, yeah, and it's cool as always. If you haven't read the book, it's fine. We can talk about it. There's some things that I can mention too, but I want to give y'all a shot. Um, you know, see what anybody else has about any anything else that anybody wants to mention about liking about the book. I'll chime in. Um, I have not read the book because okay. I just found out about the group a couple days ago. <laughs> Good. But I have the book um, and I have our next one. So I'm going to be doing that. But I Great. did attend the webinar that he did last week, oh, which okay. covered a lot of the stuff that is in the book. And I have to say, I agree with Rachel about the results. That's something we forget about. Um, right now, my, my position as marketing coordinator is brand new. It was just created back in February yeah. and um, no, actually end of February. And so I've been trying to just piecemeal market things at just to get stuff out there, but I'm also trying to step back, which is why I'm here and create a marketing plan. And really, where do we need to focus? And results are something that we forget about a lot in the library world. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good point. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it is. It's it's something that is hard because like you said, April, things are always coming at you and you know, especially in a new position. Um that uh um uh, that yeah it's hard to kind of get away from oh what is the thing that i'm marketing and how can i get the person to like that thing or use that thing or want that thing and uh it, it does it takes takes time to step back and say yeah what is it what is it about what's what's it going to do for people where where that's what can be more important is the experience for people um and i have um uh shannon from camrose who said, um, said like thinking the, uh, I like the after experience. I think we forget to think of the bigger patron experience. So that's something else to think of, you know, what is, what is beyond? And it kind of ties into the same thing. What's beyond just the satisfaction of using or the gratification or value of using the thing, but what is the entire customer experience? What is the experience? And <laughs> good, Shannon, I'm glad I got that right. What's the experience of, of uh, using the library as a whole and what, what is that all about? So um, yeah, so that was something else that was pretty cool in the book. Um, Anything in addition to like is great. Anything that anybody want to share they learned from the book, something they hadn't thought of before that maybe they did? Well, I can mention something to get it started. Um, something I thought was interesting was, um, so in the end of the book, if you haven't read the book, it's fine, but in the end of the book, he goes into talking about um, 
things like preparing for um, kind of preparing for what's next after you leave, if you have to leave, if you have to step away. Um, and I hadn't really thought about uh, thought about that before. About and I was curious what you all thought about that. Um, again, doesn't matter if you read the book or not. But has anybody thought about um, an exit strategy from your role, or what's next from your role, or what happens from your role? I mean, a lot of us all think about you know kind of what's going on right now, and we want to be successful right now. Um, some of you are, uh, many of you are are uh, considerably younger than than I am, and probably are not necessarily looking for a retirement role. <laughs> but maybe you just want to be in the role until you until you retire, which is not a bad thing. Um, I'm sort of in that way, but uh, but anyway, I just wonder if anybody's thought about that. Like you know, two things. So you know, have you thought about what's your next move and how to kind of prepare this this um, you know, role you're in so that when you move on, it's pretty easy for somebody to slide in. Um, or, um, you know, if you have to leave for an extended period of time, uh, do you ever wonder what it's going to be like when you get back and, and are you able to get away and thoroughly enjoy a vacation? Anybody think about those things or have any thoughts about those things? Go, Rachel. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, my... I'm actually really lucky in that the supervisor I have has been devoted since well before I started this job, she's been devoted to documenting everything. Um, but, and, and when I mean everything, I mean like pictures from events 17 years ago, yeah. uh, you know, event timelines from things we did eight years ago and process for everything, uh, yeah. which has been incredibly helpful, both just as I do my daily job, because I haven't I've only been at Chapman for two and a half years, but also just knowing that if I am ever, you know, hit by a bus, yeah, <laughs> hit by a bus manual, uh, it's a hit by a bus or slash win the lottery. Uh, I, I've always heard it as what if your employee gets hit by a bus or wins the lottery, like there needs to be documentation in place and we have that. And I actually, I don't work with any of you, so I can say this, I am actually currently on the job market for- Okay. <laughs> aren't important, but it's been really helpful to know and to take time just saying, okay, we already have these structures in place. Once I have worked on a new process that nobody else in the library has experience with, I take an hour or however long it takes once I'm done with that process and just write it down bullet point step by step and save it somewhere on our shared drive so that it's accessible for whoever needs to do it next, whether it's because another department is going to be doing it and needs to do it without my help or I'm not there permanently or I'm not there because I'm just on vacation and something needs to happen while I'm away. Yeah, yeah, it's a good point, Rachel. And yeah, it's, you know, and it's, so uh, Donna, I'll let you go in a sec, but just um, the uh, something that you talked about there, Rachel, was something that hit me too in the book and when you all get a chance to read it. Um, is that, uh, yeah, documenting those processes, especially when a lot of you are like, you know, departments of one and, and things like that. And documenting those processes does give you a chance to maybe think about where you can delegate those to or how you can automate those processes and something. So, you know, it's not typically something we think of in the promotion side of marketing, but it's definitely something I think it's important for us to think about in the, um, you know, in the sustainability of our roles. So Donna, what, what did you have to say about that? Well, I was just gonna say, we have a couple of people on our board that are of the opinion that if you are not physically in the library, you cannot possibly be doing any of the work that we are paying you for. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. that one, Rachel. Sure, of course. Yeah. <laughs> and so like a month ago when all of a sudden I found out I had to quarantine because my husband had exposure. It was like, well, son of a gun. And my boss said, well, what are we doing? And I said, well, it's, it's April. Um, we have, we've already announced that we're having this haiku poetry contest and this is what, you know, you need to do yada, yada, yada. It's already been announced. And, and he was like, right write up everything that you're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I said, okay, fine. And I wrote yep. it all up 
And the next day, the posts that we had out on social media that announced the haiku poetry contest had been deleted. Oh, no. And, and he just, just, <clears throat> just canceled the whole thing because, you know, even though I had the step-by-step, -step, this is everything that needs to happen and how it needs to happen and, and, and everything. And it was just, it came down to, he hired me and created my position as marketing and events coordinator so that he would not have to do my job. Mm. And if I wasn't there to do my job, it didn't get done. <laughs> well, that's, yes, that's not great. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that makes it hard. It makes it hard to do things like, like I said, like take vacations and be on vacation and you need to re re um, uh, be able to uh, break away and get refreshed and, and uh, yeah, it makes it tough. So, well, you know, if, if you I mean, can if get board, one of those good experiences, yeah. If, if our board said, oh yeah, you can re work remotely, I could have done all of it from home. Yeah, yeah, it's a bummer. I know, yeah, yeah, I know. And a lot of us, I think, are facing those same kind of situations where we're in that transition from working um, to uh, working at home to working back in the office, many of us, I'm sure. Um, Sarah Andrews wrote, <laughs> I have no money, no budget. Uh, I, I can't imagine any of us feel like that at all. <laughs> um, um, and uh, she says, I know that's a problem, but I can't change this. Now, referring to the book, does anybody have anything from the book that they heard that might be able to overcome the no money, no budget problem? Anybody think of anything from the book that, uh, that had that? Or anybody just think of anything from their experience that helps well, overcome the no money, no budget. I will I will say from my experience with having no money and no budget, that is when you get really creative, you draw on your community partners and things like that. I mean, last year my budget for summer reading was a thousand dollars and it was like okay then and in in the middle of the pandemic we basically bought everything we got no donations we did nothing this year my boss said submit a budget proposal on what do you, what you think you're going to spend it's like i have no clue what i'm going to spend because i have no idea what i'm doing as of right now, I have spent out of pocket less than $250, nice. but I'm giving away over $8,000 worth of prizes because oh, wow. I have been able to involve my community partners. I have traded advertising with my community partners. Um, you know, if you donate to us, we're going to put you on our Facebook page. We're going to put you on our website. We're going to put you on our summer reading program software so that everybody who signs in knows that hey you know chick-fil-a gave us twenty four hundred dollars worth of of kids meals and and monocles yeah, nice. us, you know yeah six thousand dollars worth of you know whatever yep yeah, so if you have that opportunity to, to talk with your community partners and um, and do some trades for advertising and promotion, definitely one option. Um, yeah, April says community partnerships are vital. Um, the other thing that April that you were talking about um, that kind of fits in here is that email marketing. So you know, um, you know, you you. Mailchimp has a free option um, and. Uh, you don't need to be, you know, at most, I, I would hope most libraries have some sort of an email service. Um, I know maybe not everybody, depending on smaller ones, but if you do have the opportunity to get um, something else, I mean, email marketing, yeah, like he says in, yeah, thanks, Megan, like, like, uh, like um, Alan says in, in his webinar and in his book, um, it's something where you can build up your own email list and that is really, really powerful to be able to, um, as Alan says and some other marketing people say, kind of come off the, um, 
come off the rented land and be operating on your own land. So, you know, in the book, he said it a little bit. And in the webinar, he said it, you know, real explicitly, right, April, where he was talking about, like, you know, um, everything leads to email. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that was one of the things that I really, really, res really resonated with me was about the email marketing. Um, we recently went to a new, uh, got a new website. We've, I mean, we've gone through a building expansion, a new director, like we've just, we're a whole new library basically. <laughs> but in the process of all of that, somewhere we lost being um, our contacts. We have mm. them through constant contact, but there's no way currently for any, if somebody wants our e-newsletter, e there's no way for them to sign up, oh, none. Wow. And they're not automatically opted in when they get a library card, nothing. Yeah. And so that's one of my biggest projects right now is trying to really revamp our email system. And like I, I spent today working on our new newsletter and oh. um, trying to get, get that into a digital format as well as paper format for the people who get, get one in here in-house. And, um, but email marketing, that I, I went to our director with it and I said, hey, I want to do this. And she goes, well, I'm hesitant about just automatically opting people in. It's like, no, okay, <laughs> here's why we need to do this. Yeah. And it's yeah. free, basically, yeah. if we can use, do it with our system. Right. Yeah. yeah. And we're creating that this, this information to send out right now. Anyway, we have about 55,500 cardholders in our library system. And nice. we have 2,000 contacts on constant contact. Yeah. That's small. less than 4%. <laughs> right. It's small, but it can grow. Um, yeah. yeah, you can't, you know, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's because something that we've done is we have, you know, a couple hundred thousand. Um, and we used to do monthly newsletters and send it out to like the whole group. Um, but we're getting away from that. And we're looking at, at these smaller groups that, that are opting in and what kind of things they want to do. So in addition to things that we might send to everybody, um, we've built some uh, like a ch like some children's lists and some adult uh, lists for different programs. And, you know, it's asking people you know, or it's finding out ways to connect with people for what kind of things they're interested in. Um, and yeah, it's been, uh, it, it can be tricky, but it's, and it can be, seem a little slow, but um, you know, all of y'all who do email marketing know that the uh, unsubscribe for libraries is like crazy low. I mean, if, yeah. you know, it's, you hardly get any unsubscribes. Um, and the open rates are amazing. So, um, you know, so if, uh, if you can keep on rolling with, um, with email marketing, it's really powerful. Megan, you have something. Yeah, I, I would just say when we were trying to sort of market, um, you know, kind of pitch for a data platform, we use Orange Boy, um, but that's a real expensive platform. And so we kind of had to prove to our board and to our management that it was going to be effective. So one of the things we did do is do a like social media campaign where we said, hey, if you want information about kids programs, sign up here. And we got sort of like what Chris said. And so it's, you want information about fitness programs, sign up here. And we did all of that and we compiled those lists and then started target emailing people for the interests that they said that they wanted. And then when we were able to say, hey, these open rates are really high and we're seeing program attendance go up, then that kind of gave us the ammunition to say, but if we had this other data platform that we could do this serious target marketing with, that would be even better for us. So that was sort of like our foray into um, pushing towards getting us that data platform. And I agree, gosh, the the opt-in is not ideal. You always want an opt-out that really helps us. And I will say we switched, when we switched to Orange Boy like three years ago, we started emailing people kind of out of nowhere and we have had everybody's email addresses. Um, so we had an op we decided to do opt-out instead of opt-in. And there was not a lot of questions about like, hey, why are you guys emailing me whatsoever? And like I said, our, our unsubscribe rate is less than 1%. 
Yeah, yeah, April, yeah. April, if you're looking for any other case studies or support from other libraries who have been successful at opt out, um, yes, <laughs> um, you definitely have a lot of support here. It, it, it has worked. Um, people love to hear from libraries. People love, you know, they just, they do. And opting out of, you know, just a very, and, and uh, you know, some ways you can work it is you can just give them the opportunity to opt out. Um, you know, you can give them the opportunity to opt out. So if you can email all of them based on emails that are in your database now, um, then you can uh, send them an email and say, hey, we're starting, you know, this kind of thing, like Megan said, for kids or for something else. And then uh, give, you know, give them one shot to opt out and then don't email them again unless they, you know, have. So there's some ways that you can do it that's a little creative. Um, and uh, Rachel said, yeah, when her library met with the university office, um, they were stunned by how high the newsletter rates are. It is amazing. I mean, if you've worked in other industries um, or just read about other industries, the, uh, the open rates are, are really, really high and, and that can help you get your click rates up. And Tammy said, switched um, to opt out for email circulation staff. Yeah, adds people to subscribe to the list. And that's a great way of, you know, again, even if you can't maybe start where you are with your historical emails. Um, there are things that you can do to get uh, circuit to get circulation and frontline people connecting with folks and, and getting those emails for um, things that they want to hear about. So yeah, a good way is to segment maybe into a couple of things like interest in computer and kids programs and things like that. So yeah, Donna, you had something. Well, when I started here, right off the bat, I was told that I could not do an opt out email newsletter because a, another library in our vicinity had um, signed up for an email service and they generated some report from the cardholder database that we share with 1300 other libraries in our ILL oh. consortium. Yeah. And when they Not sent great. out their opt out newsletter, they sent it to every card holder in the northern two thirds of Illinois from yeah. any library. <laughs> Yeah, probably not the most responsible practice. Yeah, yeah, no, <laughs> yeah would not suggest yeah. buying lists or or getting lists. Yeah, yeah definitely. So, well, no, they, they just they yeah. download don't downloaded a report, but yeah. they literally downloaded a report of every card holder in the consortium, not every yeah. card holder assigned to their library. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. They <laughs> so, made a bad decision. Yeah. That's that's yeah. So that's I was told I couldn't do it, and I waited and I waited and I said, you know. I know what I'm doing with this newsletter. I've generated a report of just our card holders. I'm gonna send them. So now we have, there's like a little introductory letter that goes along with the first email when we, when we send out, when we add them to our newsletter mailing list. It says, hey, you know, you're getting this newsletter mailing list and it's gonna come once a week and it's gonna, and if you wanna stop it, click here, but we really hope you won't right. and um, right now we're, we're sending out to just under 4,000 people every week and I've nice. had less than 300 say, no, thank you. Don't send me any more email. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty low. So that's good. Yeah. That's a good, that's a good, uh, result. Um, so yeah. Um, what other things, anything, anything else just in general about the book, anything that, you know, we, we haven't talked about what it lacked or even though we've talked about that in some ways, but, um, what it lacked or what you longed for anything in particular, anybody wanted to point out there. If nobody else has anything, I feel like I've been saying a lot, so I don't want to dominate <laughs> this conversation. Thanks Rachel. No, that's good. Okay, um, I, I think one thing that I've been struggling with with a couple of these books that I sure. was hoping we could talk about is how to yeah. measure something like an ROI or, you know, he talks about the PVP formula when you're in a nonprofit situation <laughs> yeah. where profits or income, it, it, that's not part of the equation. So, I mean, I, I know there are all sorts of metrics we can use in terms of door numbers and 
attendance at events and programming and stuff like that. But I'm wondering what other people look at, especially for things like ROI on if you do paid advertisements um, or things like that. That's a great question. Anybody have some experience or thoughts to share about that, about um, what you're measuring, um, what's helping? April? We're starting into a little bit of um, boosting posts on social media specifically. Yeah. And because the way that we are measuring our, our social media is engagement, so with those, I just focus specifically on increasing engagement. Right now, we're fully reopened from COVID. So um, as of, I think, Monday. <laughs> um, so wow. what we're trying to do is to let everybody know that we're still here. I mean, we, we've been providing services the entire time, and we've had our building open for almost, in, in some capacity, for almost a year. And there's still people who are going, are you guys open yet? Yeah. And so one of, so my thought, so the more people that engage with it, the more people see it. So that's really where I'm focusing on right now is just saying, hey, we're here and you can come mm -hmm. in. But um, with, for those, the return on the investment is pretty clear. You say, this is how much I'm spending. This is how much I got back out of it. This is how much each of those cost. So those are nice. Beyond that, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's tough. Um... It, yeah, it, it's difficult. Rachel, I totally agree. And that's something that always jumps out at me is the um, the participation or the um, the return on investment formula. Um, Try to catch a note here to see if I saw if I had a note about that, but I'm not sure. Donna, you had something about metrics. Well, one of the one of the things that we have taken to is no matter what we are doing, you know, whether we're registering people through a Google form or whether it's through, you know, the Zoom sign up or whatever it is, we include that little custom question. How did you hear about this event? How did you hear about this program? How did you hear, you know, where did you hear it? Was it on Facebook? Was it on a radio ad? Was it on a print ad? You know, and, and find all of those, those sources you know, and, and because that is really more about, okay, is it word of mouth? If so, who did you hear it from? Because we need to make sure that we're engaging those patrons. Um, and that's really- Yeah, that, yeah, how did you hear is a good one. You know, having, having that, how did you hear about this program or event or whatever it is, really has been helpful. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's great, Donna. We, um, so we have been doing for um, several months, I want to say maybe even closing in on a year, um, a net promoter score through, uh, we use Orange, we use Savannah from Orange Boy, but um, we've been doing a net promoter score survey. And yeah, that's been really valuable to see the how did you hears there because it kind of helps to do that. Something else we've been doing um, that I can mention that can tie back to the return on investing in a certain thing is we have been trying to use, um, we've been trying to use bit.ly codes. Now we're not trying to use those just to shorten URLs or things like that, but we're actually trying to use those so that like when we place an ad in a place. And we don't have a lot of ad money either. I have $1,277 a year for the last two years. Um, but uh, but when we place an ad, when we do spend a little bit of money to place an ad, instead of using like our URL or you know something like that, we'll use a Bitly code for that direction. And um, what that does then that helps us know that oh that came from that location. We we can do it through Google, but Google's not quite as I don't know. I haven't I haven't found Google um, Analytics to be quite as easy to um, to tell uh, what that what that is all the time, the source, because there's some things about where the source comes in that you can't really know. Um, we have a couple things in the chat that I want to mention. Um, so uh, yeah, I'll make sure to get these chat notes out too, because there's some out oh, there's definitely some good stuff in there. But Angela um, posted uh, 
the Panorama Project Library Marketing Valuation Toolkit. So something that we all should take a look at. Um, and maybe Angela can can tell us uh, just a little bit about that. Um, yeah. I yeah, can share ahead, my Angel. screen if you want to. <laughs> Please do, <laughs> yeah. It to you. Yeah. Oh, I can't. You've you've disabled my screen sharing. Oh, come on. <laughs> How do I do that? How do I undo that? Okay. Oh, it's multiple a... permit. Per, let me see. Anyway, uh, all participants. There you go. All, right. all participants. Can you oh, share? Oh my down? goodness, I can indeed. Sweet. All right. Thank you. So I'm going to turn my video off because you don't want to look at the side of my face. <laughs> this is a thing that came, I think that I heard the Panorama Project folks talk about this last fall at a conference and then it came out, I don't want to say de maybe December or January. I really, really wish I'd had something like this when I worked in a library. I mean, they've got already, this is like average market value, but if you really want to figure out your ROI, you can just put like put in the number of website visits, your catalog, how many people actually opened your email. That's not a percentage, but you'd have to be able to see the exact number of people like advertising. And it may not be exact. And this is supposed to be for book author events, but I'll be honest with you. I think this will work for any kind of marketing campaign. So you just put in the numbers and it tells you like, how much value you're creating, which I think is really incredible. So um, if I still worked in a library, I would bookmark this thing and I would be using it all the time. So I hope you guys find that helpful. I had nothing to do with putting it together. I just think it's a fantastic tool. That's awesome, Angela. Yes, you're getting kudos in the chat for that too, but it, it is really wonderful. It's, um, and the thing, like you were saying, Angela, is you know, yeah, it may not be exactly what it is for us or anything, but if you keep using this and you use this all the time, then you're setting a level and then, you know, that way it's going to, um, it's going to be meaningful over time because you're always valuing things with the same, um, same base and same formula, right? So, yeah. Yeah. And then if you scroll down here, you can see if you are doing an author event, it gives you a place to put in how many copies of a book and the thing that they were saying at this conference was that libraries need to start sending these reports to publishers when you have author talks so that they understand that the programs you're doing at the library are helping them to sell books and to get recognition for their authors. And that I think that was the whole goal actually of putting this together for them. They, they wanted to, you know, we had the thing in 2019 where we were fighting for ebook access for libraries. And so this, yeah. I think, was their reaction to that or the, the way they're going to try to not have that ever happen again. So, so I just think it's a great tool. It's awesome. Thank you so much, Angela. You're I appreciate welcome. that. Thanks for sharing that. Um, so yeah, any, uh, what, any other ideas or thoughts or experiences with valuation and how to value? I think we have some other in the chat too. Um, but if anybody wants to speak up, go ahead and speak up. Can you hear me? Um, yeah, hey. I think that there's something to be said for um, comparing hey. metrics from last year. So take summer yeah. reading, for example, those are programs that you're doing over and over again. So this year we're advertising and paying to advertise them. And it's already through the roof, a completely different metric as far as last year. So I think just really keeping track year to year what you did differently and how that affected not only attendance, but participation. Yeah, that's great, Amanda. That's good advice. Yeah, because sometimes, yeah, if, if uh, yeah, just looking at, at, at um, advances over the past can definitely make a difference. Um, yeah, especially when you're changing your tactics and then and then that's a nice way to say that, hey, it's making a difference. It's, it's doing something different. Um, and uh, Joanne says she hasn't read the book, but the one page concept appeals to her lazy side. Um, is one page really enough for adequate planning? Did anybody actually try the one page um, format? Did anybody give it a shot? I did a little bit. I can't say I completed it. We have um, way too much information that has to go <laughs> into it. With, with six branches and 20 staff people and, and no. I can't get it all on one page. I couldn't get I think, it all on one page in eight point font. 
<laughs> I think it's hard. Yeah, I, when I was reading the book too, I got that sense. And and please, anybody else, jump in. Um, but uh, I did get the sense that it might be difficult to do the one page, Joanne, for your entire marketing plan, like an entire annual marketing plan with everything. But I think it could work for a campaign, um, you know, when you're looking at targeting. April, you look like you may have something to share. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Um, it wouldn't work for like the whole plan. I, like I was trying to figure out, I'm trying to do... Um, any way you library is my big thing. Trying to market the library as a convenience and that we're here anyway. Yeah, write it down, it's fine. Yeah, <laughs> any way you like that, yes. <laughs> um, and so trying to, tr to take that and break that down onto one page, there's no way. But if I wanted to break it down into certain different elements, that could fit on one page and just focus on those individually. But yeah, I don't think that there's a like, if like, this is my plan for 2021, no. It's not gonna work. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it might be tricky. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Shannon likes that. Yes. Um, yeah, I think I think it would be tough for for everything. Like Donna said, there's so much going on. We, you know, you are tough. But you know, that was something else that was pretty interesting in the book. And I don't know um, if anybody else has anything to say about that. Though there was definitely things in there about. Um, uh, one thing in there was similar to this concept was the marketing by hope. <laughs> so uh, we open a business, we start it up, we, uh, you know, get a building and uh, we just hope that people come in. And I, I have to admit, there are some times that it feels like that here that, uh, that you're like, man, we just hope that people, come, you know, um, kind of like April, what you were saying, <laughs> we hope people come back to our buildings, but there are, you know, but, but what I liked about it was that there was talk more about, um, you know, not getting in that, in that mindset and trying to think of some different things and trying to think of, of how to reach some different people. So, um, yeah, let me see. You've got other good stuff in here. Um, yeah, bit.ly and URLs and QR codes. Yeah, I don't think, uh, who else is using QR codes and what kind of experience have you had? We just started using them recently on some of our, like if we're advertising in certain places that um, we haven't tried before. And uh, what we've been doing a lot of like what we've found in the pandemic is direct mail is really um, sort of coming back, like going back to analog because like the mailman was the only person that came to your door. And so you were pretty excited to see him. <laughs> so all of a sudden people are really interested in direct mail. So we're doing targeted direct mail. So for instance, um, our campaign for summer reading, we are gonna do a postcard to all households in Baltimore city that have school aged children but it's really hard for me to actually say, hey, this postcard was really successful unless I have like a really specific way um, to track that. So what we did was we put a custom URL on that card. So it's like, instead of prattlibrary.org summer break, it's prattlibrary.org like summer or something like that. So that way my web person can track where that came from as a custom URL. And then we put a QR code on it and I think you guys are all experiencing this is like, I thought QR codes were dead and gone, but now all the restaurant menus are QR codes. And um, so I like a year ago laughed at people who wanted to use QR codes, wouldn't use them for anything because I thought they were dead and gone. And now every restaurant I go to has a QR code and everyone suddenly knows how to use them again. So those are the two ways we're tracking things that are previously have been really untrackable like direct mail. Yeah. That's very cool. Yeah, it's funny. Yeah, even Amanda said, I've only used one when I wanted to see a menu. <laughs> so, yeah, um, yeah, it, yeah, they are. They're, they're, you know, they're things that came back through, uh, through the, um, through COVID, like QR codes and, and uh, more ways to connect digitally. Um, Megan, I, I have a question. I was oh, go say, ahead. Uh, well, about QR codes, has the iPhone always scanned QR codes or is that a new thing? That's why I thought maybe contributes to its popularity. Now people understand how to do that instead of having to download the app and everything. That's what, that's why I kind of thought, but maybe, uh, the, maybe the functionality was always there, but maybe, I don't know, maybe it's me. I, I don't think Joanne, it was always there, but I think um, in, in maybe an operating system from 
maybe past couple of years, it, it's been added into the camera functionality. Um, Kate, did you have something to share? Yes, um, I guess similar to Megan, um, someone kind of told me that QR codes are coming back. It was actually one of our, it was actually our youth services librarian. And um, so, okay, let's give it a try. So uh, the way we primarily use it is uh, registra registration for events. And so we use Google Forms and they can just go straight to the registration form. I've also used it for um, job applications if people want to uh, view our job description um, or they can go straight to the application. Um, so that's been useful to use the QR code that way. So, um, you know, as far as uh, like big campaigns using the QR code. Uh, we really haven't done that, but it, but it is useful if you want to direct somebody to a certain spot uh, on your website that has an anchor or something, you know, you can, you can send them right there. So that's yeah. been really helpful. And we, we really just started them, started using those probably a year and a half ago. So still pretty yeah. new. Yeah, and uh, QR codes free. So it doesn't cost anything right now to use uh, lots of QR code creators. I recommend you do sign up for one though, and um, you know use the same service when you're using it and have other departments that might use it, use the same service so you can track all of them. But um, yeah, some but, of the, yeah, the QR code uh, generator that we use, you can also put your logo in the middle of it, which is kind of nice. fun. <laughs> you cute. can make it yeah. different colors, so yeah. Yep, you can, yeah, a lot of them you can brand and you can you can adjust, so it's very nice. Um, and uh, yeah, Joanne said, which one is the one that you can brand? So if you can think of it, uh, Kate, if you can share it in the chat, that would be great. Um, I will do that. I think it's just QR code generator, but I'll look it up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're all called something almost yeah. exactly like that. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, Shannon, did we talk about, have you, um, oh, one plan to reach many different markets. Yeah, that was what we were talking about, um, to do separate plans for each. Yeah, I think it, it is, you know, useful to do separate plans for each. Um, there, you know, it's hard. Yeah, that, that is definitely another thing in the book that, that he talks about is, um, you know, you can't reach everybody, which is something that I really liked because it's something that sometimes is hard to impress upon um, people uh, that we work with here. And uh, I sound like I'm uh, talking down to that. <laughs> I don't mean to, but I, you know, I, does anybody else have that same experience where somebody thinks, well, you know, just put this out and then people will know or tell people that the library has everything and then they'll know that it's for everyone. And, um, and it's, it's not, uh, it's not possible to tell somebody that everything is for everyone. Um, it's, it's just too broad of a target. Um, if you read some of Angela's blogs, I'm sure you'll see that, uh, that it's too big of a target to just say, yes, the library is for everyone everybody come on and you'll find something that you like um and oh yeah go ahead i was gonna say one of the the biggest uphill challenges we have had this year is we are switching the focus of our summer reading program from kids to families mm. and and you know and it's like okay our summer reading program is open to anybody from zero to 109 and if you have someone in your family who's older than 109 and they want to participate, let me know. I'll change the age cap. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, going off of the idea that, you know, kids are going to model reading behavior if they see their parents or grandparents or aunts sure. or uncles or, you know, whoever, the adults around them are also reading they are also participating in this. The kids are going to be more inclined to do it on their own. So yeah. let's read as a family. That yeah, that's really been that's a, a mindset change that a lot of our patrons are not accustomed to. 
Yeah, oh, it's a good point. And I think when, you know, and I think the good thing is when you're delivering those messages is that, you know, that is a message that you can deliver and target at parents. And then you can deliver and target a different message at kids so that the parents get the model behavior, the kids get, oh, you know, some fun and, and, and reward from doing it. And, you know, and that's the kind of thing. So yeah, while our stuff is for everybody, for sure, like Megan said, marketing to everyone is marketing to no one. So um, yeah, you can't, uh, um, uh, you know, you can't just, it, it's definitely much more of a shotgun approach. And it's nice to hear books like this and, and you know, Cordelia's book and, and other books talk about, um, talk about that kind of thing. Um, yeah, so yeah, you can target, yes, you can target to grandparents or older caregivers. That's a great idea, Angela, to model good behavior. And those are some audiences that, that you can find, um, uh, that, uh, that you can find ways to connect with. So that's great. We have a few minutes left. Anything else before, you know, while we're still talking about the book, anything anybody wanted to share about the book, any other experiences or any questions that anybody has for the group about anything? What's the next book? Oh, good question, Amanda. Uh, <laughs> so the next book is uh, called Contagious. Um, by, uh, there you go, you look in April's window, um, uh, Contagious by Jonah Berger. Um, so it is, uh, you know, one, one in, in, that, in a genre of books that talks about, um, you know, buzzwordy would be to say viral uh, marketing, but uh, that, you know, it's, it's definitely not just about, you know, hey, do this and go viral and everything will be great. Um, it's about behavior and how behavior catches on and how um, different things um, can lead to different results in, uh, you know, with Mark. And it's, you know, it's marketing and promotion book, but yeah, it's a good book, Contagious by Jonah Berger. So um, we will read that this month. We will look, um, we'll talk about that again at the end of the month. Um, and April, did you have something to? I did. Um, I actually yeah. had a question for Megan. You had mentioned the, the targeted postcards for summer reading. That's something I've been thinking about. Um, I have a folder where all of the ones that I receive from other libraries or other things, I just hold on to them and think about them. Um, but how, I mean, yes, you've got a QR code on there, but like, how many did you send out? How much did that cost? I want some more information on that. Sure. So we have a separate budget. So long story short, um, this never happens in my department, but it happens to other people's department, apparently. Um, we have uh, like gathered a lot of money for summer reading that over the years was never spent. So this year we had a quarter million dollars to spend on summer reading, which I was like, give me a chunk of that change. I would never let a quarter million dollars sit there ever. So um, so we have been able to spend a really significant amount um, on, uh, on summer challenge or our summer break Baltimore marketing. So we're actually doing like a subscription box type thing this year where every single month you get a box with books and t-shirts and all kinds of stuff. So um, it's just epically marketable, right? So yeah. we use, we have a printing company that we work with that gets us, um, that can also do direct mail for us. They do postage for us. So they can pull specific lists for us. And we've got to pay for the lists of addresses because the idea with the, um, the idea with the postcards is we're trying to hit households that don't have library cards. Um, because I can already get my houses that have library cards because I'm emailing them that have active library cards. So I can already speak to them. I need the houses that I'm not speaking to. So I want to say the entire campaign is costing me around $6,000. And I think we're going to, God, I want to say like, I, you know what? I don't have the number. It's thousands of households. Like it's in the thousands. It's below 10,000. Um, but it, it's hard. I mean, with direct mail, it's just hard. It's hard to track if it's successful. So we're going to put it out there and see. What I will say is we did this and we didn't use a QR code um, for a back to school campaign. So that's my dog. Um, <laughs> and we were trying to get people to sign up for an e-card back in September. And the three weeks that the postcard went out, we saw like double to triple the amount of people sign up for the e-cards in those weeks. 
now I'm going to be excited to actually do more of the custom URL and the QR code to kind of directly link it back to that postcard. But yeah, I think it's around six grand for what we're doing. And we used a printing company that could get us those postage lists. And I will tell you, like the first list they gave me, I was trying for like all kids and it came back like it was a thirteen, fourteen thousand dollar venture. And then I was like, let's narrow it down to elementary entry school kids so you can keep narrowing it down and you can do like if I don't have a lot of money I will take a look at where summer reading performed the worst like around what branches it performed the worst and can I target the households in those zip codes and see if I can move the metrics in that library so there's a way to do it that's a lot cheaper than trying to send postcards to all kids in the city yeah yeah Thanks, Megan. That's awesome. Uh, great information. Um, and if you want to hear that again, you'll be able to hear a replay of this once I get it up on the website. Um, but uh, yeah, about a dollar a piece is what I remember direct mail being. So it's it's that's a fairly, you know, maybe a good rule of thumb, dollar a piece or so for a piece of direct mail. But um, and if you can use that sheet that Angela gave us to track the value of it, then you can uh, you can kind of uh, get a good idea like Rachel was asking about the ROI. So um, thanks so much, everybody, for uh, for coming today. I hope you had a good time. I hope you enjoyed the conversation. Thanks for participating in, in chat and text and, and voice. Um, before we go, don't leave. Um, we need to pick a winner for a copy of next month's book. Um, and uh, so uh, April, you've been uh, wonderfully participative for your first meeting, jumping in. So pick a number between, let me see, one and um, 13. Five. Two, three, four. Angela Hirsch. <laughs> Angela wins a copy of, of Contagious. Um, and uh, I, I'll see if she'll stick to it. I'm going to help her. Uh, somebody who won last month's book was Lily uh, Stevenson, and Lily offered to pay for this month's book. So very nice. Oh, of her my that. gosh. That's so nice. And, uh, so, uh, so very cool. So well, I can um, pay Angela, for next month's book. <laughs> well, we'll, just, we'll just keep paying it forward <laughs> absolutely fine and maybe i'll have to start throwing in an extra copy of the book because i want <laughs> but, but i love i love thank you that, that that's yeah. working out sure. so thanks so much everybody um i'll be putting a survey up on the facebook page if you can fill it out to let me know what you thought of today and any questions or suggestions and um have a wonderful wonderful week a wonderful month uh look forward to talking to you online and thanks so much okay, bye.